Hi, I'm Joe West. Welcome to my studio, The West Barn. As a songwriter, I've written number ones for Jimmy Wayne, Toby Keith, Keith Urban. As a mix engineer or engineer, I've worked on records for Emmylou Harris, Warren Zevon, uh, Shakira, Justin Timberlake. A wide, varied stance of trip away through pop country. The first Joey and Rory project that I was a part of, I mixed Cheater Cheater, which was their first single. The second project that I worked with Joey and Rory on would be the Inspired album and DVD. It was all cut here at my barn. I produced it, I mixed it, uh, did a lot of the tracking. And it was over the course of two weeks of tracking. Really cool, really organic record, a lot of fun to make. The third project that I worked with Joey and Rory on would be this Hymns record and DVD. I mixed that record, I produced that record, did a bunch of engineering on that record. We didn't anticipate it having the impact that it had. It's a 10-week number one on Billboard on the Christian charts, as well as a four-week number one on the country charts. A traditional record of, of hymns outsold every record in the United States. I've never had a real job. I worked at a little local pizza place in high school when I was a lifeguard, but I've never had a legitimate job where I've actually gone in what people would call maybe a career. I've always done music, and I've been lucky enough to do that, but you never know until you get to a certain point that you're gonna have the liberty to do it next year and the year after, let alone five years and 10 year plans. I think the first time I realized that I was really gonna be able to stay in it and that I was in the music business per se was probably my first number one as a songwriter. And on my first number one that I had, I had written the song, I had produced the song, I had mixed the song and played the majority of the instruments on it just because that was how that song in particular happened. Um, and at that point, that was, it was a three-week number one, and I remember thinking, okay, I get to do this. I'm in the music business now. I have a little breathing room. I started off uh, in the seventh grade, started playing piano. And, you know, if you see my senior picture, it's me leaning up against a Juno 106 in a very awkward pose. Um, but, you know, very quickly turned into guitar and everything else. When you're in the studio, especially in New York, you have to play everything, not because you're the right guy for the job, but because you're the only guy for the job, because there's a bass hanging on the wall and you need a bass part. And six hours later, via Pro Tools, you've got a bass part. It's pretty good. Um, and there's plus and minuses to that, but it shaped the way it was. I didn't know it then, but it was teaching me how to be a record producer. And it got to a point in my career where I realized, man, I don't want to be out doing that. I want to be here in the studio making the record. If I were an artist, and I'd like to think I'm an artist, right? Because everything we do, we want it to be art. We want it to be at a very high level. Uh, I'd like to think that my art is, me being an artist, is my role in the studio. An audio engineer to me was someone that wore a lab coat, you know, and I felt like I'd have to go to electrical engineering school. And So I don't know that I ever felt like I would become an audio engineer. Um, and just knowing that I wanted to be on that side of the glass, making the records and making the decisions and making sure that it was, um, that there was a vibe. You know, even with this photo shoot, I've been like really concerned with like, what's it gonna look like? What's it gonna feel like? I've always had that. I don't know what that is, but that's almost more important to me sometimes than it being perfectly in focus or having a sound that's totally pristine. I'd rather have a sound that has personality. You know, something that you remember. There's, there's records that I remember a specific thing about the guitar. When there's a James Taylor record where you can hear a whistle on his nose while he's playing this beautiful intro. And it's my favorite part of the record, you know, because I felt like I was there. I felt like I was part of it. So I think that was more what I connected to, was like being able to be in charge of and look for those moments that I would be able to exploit and exaggerate. Because if they're the topic of conversation in, on a record, well, then everything else kind of just facilitates it. And, and that's what I was drawn to originally. From a sonic perspective, guys who made records that I really identified with, you know, consistently putting out a sound that I could identify and say, I bet you that Tom Lord Algie mixed that. And you're probably right. So Tom and Chris Lord Algie were huge. Uh, I was in New York during some of the, it's some of the, most of the 90s, and, and I would continually work on records that they were working on. And, and I'd hear their mixes and just be like, man, I got to step it up. So those guys were an inspiration. Frank Filippetti, 
as another genius that, you know, you hear records that he makes and you're like, I want to make records like that. And then there's just specific records. Brendan O'Brien's another one. He's a guy that never makes the same record twice. I have 100% Fun by Matthew Sweet. And that record's nothing like the ACDC record he did or, you know, even the, the first Blood Sugar Sex Magic. He engineered that. And, and man, I mean, it's just like perfect for what it is. So there's plenty of guys that show up on the radar and you'll have a song you love and you go, who did that? I want to see who did that. The old days where we'd have to recall a bunch of racks outboard gear and reset an SSL, and I was never convinced. I've never had a recall come back up exactly where I left it. You know, there's always just the tiniest little thing can change the whole shape and vibe of a mix. And the plugins, you know, for me, bring that consistency for left to right issues and or recallability. Uh, and to be able to do that a year later, I mean, how do you put a price on that? And, and they sound so good that it's not a sonic compromise. So you end up in a situation where you're able to get everything you need and separate digital plugins into a couple categories, but you're able to get all the vibe that you need from a lot of these artist signature series, like the Kramer stuff or the JJP or the CLA stuff. That stuff really has, you know, the grit. It does something different than EQs do, you know? So if something is on your list of EQ and then you run it through uh, an LA-3A, you know, or a CLA-76, you run it through that, I find that I don't have to EQ it, you know? So those are making some solutions for me that I thought I would have to maybe EQ it and I'm able to deal with it in a different way. In my current configuration, it ends up being a C4 or a C6. It could be a low harmonics generator if needed, or it might be an NLS gain stage that I love the TGI 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, to add a little bit of width to the mid-range. could have some of that. It's definitely going to have um, a tape machine. And I love the Kramer tape machine at 7.5 hips, the one that takes the high end off. There's a great, I'll always audition a mix through the lower setting, which has the lower shelf on it. Those things are usually on there, uh, unless I know I'm going to hit my tape machine. And then it goes from there, it goes out through a set of summing amps, a dangerous two bus, which then gets fed to an Allen Smart, which is the SSL compressor. Usually that's where I'll add a little bit of the pump, and then I put a little bit of the, I have a set of Neve 32264As <clears throat> that I'll have a really long release time on, and I'll just let that sweep over the top and sort of Zamboni machine the whole thing. And then from there, it will hit uh, a Pultec, a Manly Pultec EQ usually. And then it's going to re-hit converters and go back in, or it will go to a tape machine, and depending on what point. A lot of times nowadays, they want you to master the record while you're doing it as well to just get level. So it depends on what they're calling for at the end of the day. But that's a pretty general session. Most of the Keller comes from that C4. Most of it is going to really, most of the intensity and the what really brings that up to the, oh, wow, what'd you just do? You know, whenever you put that on everyone's sort of, what just happened? That whole thing just came alive. Mostly the C4 that comes from. Those are more creative plugins. Like when I put them on something, they kind of change the vibe of it in a good way. So I find myself reaching for those when I'm searching for trying to make a track come alive. So, you know, the all the vintage compressor series and the uh, transistors and the, the Kramer stuff and the JJP stuff, they, they change the vibe a little bit in a good way. They give me a little, they put a little hair on it so that when you bring them up, you can make it say something. Um, so I love them for that. And that's when I reach for them. The NLS stuff, the NLS bus uh, and the NLS channel stuff, I'll use that whenever I'm just sort of lost and I don't have a mid range that I can really work with. It will generate kind of generate harmonic content that wasn't there before. You can change the shape of it. And I don't necessarily want it to be a specific thing as much as I want to find something to identify with and make great. And those plugins will generate that stuff. And it's not EQ. When you put that TransX plugin, the multiband one I've been doing a lot of work with recently, it's like presence on an amplifier. It's different than high end. It's different than EQ. It does something that, that's not just stacking on top of other processes in my mix. It's something that makes that sit in a little different spot and react a little different. It's, there's clarity there now that I could never EQ into it. It's hard to explain, but it's just a different breed of cat. It's a different process that is not stacking on the rest of the mix, where it's just like you end up in this situation where you have a ton of things, a ton of sameness on top of sameness, 
and you start to lack clarity and intelligibility of what you want that mix to do and move and say, having all those different models at your fingerprint, at your, at your fingertips and being able to pick the right ones, you can end up in a situation where now the whole mix is, spe- is speaking to you in a way that there's no clutter. Um, and I love that. I find myself using the CLA 76 a lot on bass. I'll use it on snare drum. I'll use the blue stripe one if I want to get push things a little harder on the drum bus and I'll do a quick attack and release if I just want it to feel a little bit more polished and have the drum sing a little more. I'll stack that before a C4 maybe on the drum kit and just touch it a little bit to give it a little bit of a shape. Uh, and I'll do that with the blue stripe one because it's a little grittier and a little bit more exaggerated. I love the LA3A. That one gets used a lot. The Pi gets used a lot. The Puig Child 670 gets used a ton. That on piano is fantastic. They have a setting on there called West Coast Piano. You dial that in and you just turn it up. It's done. You know, that's your piano sound. And you're able at that point to then crank some, maybe that high end in. You need to find where in your mix that piano is going to be able to speak. But if you get a really nice bright piano that's played really cool and you can bring it up in the mix, that on there will really, you know, just the whole thing, all the resonance gets sucked up and you can really do something with it. Uh, you can really, with the, with the signature series stuff, you can really shape the vibe of your mix. Rather than just sitting there with a real sterile EQ and working on something, you end up sort of like, after it's all put together, you might have the frequency where you want it, but it seems to lack a little vibe where these things feel like you got a little mojo. You got something to, it's singing already. So you're just trying to get enough of it singing and singing in harmony with one another. Uh, and it feels like a record all of a sudden, rather than just feeling like a, a recording. You know, there's that leap to, hey, it feels like a record now. And I love that. Those do a lot of that. But you do have the ability to go in there with an EQ and get a narrow bandpass filter with a Q of 13 or 15 and just grab the tiniest little thing that's annoying and take it out. You can do that as well. That would, that I would put in the, more the tools basket, you know, how I classify the Waves plugins. Um, and I like, I use the one knobs a lot. I was just doing an interview with somebody and they were really, they were really surprised that I used the one knob. And I just think that those like pressure, pressure for the most part does something really cool. And if I'm having trouble with something and I just cannot figure it out and I'm down to maybe the fifth or sixth drawer of tricks, I'll reach for that and put it on there and just to listen to it. It may not stay on there. It may stay on there, but it's great for loops that you then want to flange out. I love Metaflanger. I love Mondo Mod. Those are old ones, but they're great. You know, you put that on an acoustic guitar and bring the blend, the mix all the way down to maybe seven. So it's only seven, seven percent in. And it's just the tiniest little envelope that no one would really even notice. But man, it just takes it and does something to it. And it's just the perfect thing for that. There's a lot of those little tricks that I'll find myself doing a lot. Things that people would never point at in a mix. But at the end of it, they know, they know by the way it hits them that, that it's more moving, you know, and it's something that will end up pretty consistent. You know, there's certain Waves plugins that end up sort of, okay, let's get a template up. These would load up automatically, these 10 plugins in these spots. And then there's all the stuff you do to really, um, when a mix is speaking to you, you, you reach for these plugins that you know you can help it uh, exaggerate whatever that, whatever, however it's speaking. You can really help it come into its own and it would really um, exploit what it is you're trying to dig into in that particular track. And those are a game day decision where you just get a track and you're starting to think, what can I put this through? What can I do with this? And yeah, there, there's, there's a ton though. I mean, I could not work. Uh, I was telling one of the guys earlier, I couldn't do, if I lost Waves plugins, I'd have to relearn how to ride the bike quite a bit. I've become so reliant on them. There's such a huge part of how I get my sound so quickly that I'd really have to hunker down and rethink It'd be a lot tougher for me. I'm able to get places really quickly uh, with the plugins I have in my arsenal. All the signature stuff is really where the vibe, the personality of my mix seems to come out. Those things really add a ton of that to my mixes. So I reach for those early and often. Those are all over my mixes and all of them, they're really well done. All of them are really well thought out too. I appreciate that because these guys aren't just putting plugins out to put them out. They're putting them out in a thoughtful manner that, that kind of reveals their workflow a little bit. It's kind of a really cool cheat, you know, where it's like, hey, this is how, this is how he sees vocals. 
this is how he feels about drums. This is where he thinks, this is where he thinks the high end should be on a snare drum. That's really cool because it's a little bit of a tutorial. Those guys are showing you a little bit behind the curtain on how they do what they do. You don't get that. You know, who gets that? These guys are monster guys and, and here you are able to get sort of a look behind at the root level of how they see music and what they want from a drum kit. That's really cool. Even if you don't use that setting, it'll open your mind up to it. I recently saw something with Chris where he was cranking a ton of really of a really high frequency into the snare drum. And I thought, man, I wouldn't do that. And I've been doing it the last couple of weeks and really liking some of what it's, you know, I've pulled back or added a little bit more of it. But it's something that it's got me thinking a little differently. And that's cool, man, to be able to change your workflow, especially whenever you've got uh, tutelage from some of those guys that are just making monster records and getting to sit at the same table with those guys or something else. My master bus is heavy with plugins. It's loaded every slot usually. Um, but there's always, and some of it lives in the analog world at my room. Um, but there's always an EQ, hopefully a tube EQ that sort of softens and adds some harmonic content. There's always some compressors, various kinds and from compression to limiting release times that are usually shorter, pumpier up front, and then some longer release, like one and a half second release times to smooth out that and shape it a little. Um, and then from there, it usually goes to an analog tape machine. And then I print off the analog tape machine sometimes through some processing to store it back. All in an effort, not necessarily to compress it, but to sort of give it a uh, personality. Something that happens when you cross thresholds. Whenever a vocalist leaves and a solo comes in and there's this transition where they were the dominant thing in the mix and they're controlling your threshold. And then all of a sudden they duck down and a lead guitar comes up and all of a sudden that lead guitar starts to then tell that threshold what to do. There's something about the cohesiveness of that in a two mix that I really like. And it seems to feed energy and make a band that maybe could be perceived as anemic feel like rock stars. You can do that on your two mix. And it's, it's a double-edged sword because you can really easily get into a situation where you've overdone it and overcooked a mix. And, and you gotta pull it back. You gotta know when that's the appropriate time to pull it back. I've been using the Manny Tone Shaper quite a bit and it does things that other EQs won't do. Where I was failing to get what I needed to match a vocal, say we're going from a live vocal to a studio vocal or a vocal that was done on a bus, I was able to do it better with that plugin uh, just because of the inner workings of it. I don't know what they're doing, but it was, it was doing something that I couldn't get through a regular EQ. So it was easy for me at that point. And I used it all over this one record in particular where I was having to go between multiple sources and make them into a lead vocal. And um, it saved the day with that particular record. It's hard for me to know really what other people aren't doing. You know, I'd say the C4 thing, that's a gag that you put on it and it just does something ridiculous. You put it on, start with too much limiting and then ease up, bring the threshold all the way up and just bring it down slightly. And you could take a drummer that was not convicted about a part and turn him into Jeff Beccaro or John Bonham. You know, it, it's like a different drummer played it, you know? So there's plugins that do that, right? And then there's plugins that just right off the back end, they are automatically just easily changing the sound, right? So it's a lot of the times when you decide to reach for a plugin, you're looking for it to solve a problem or to do something that you need. I very rarely just put up a plugin. Sometimes you'll see guys' sessions and every one of their plugins, their cues are all filled up. Or they'll have a vocal chain that's already populated. It's like, I don't know what I'm going to use on a vocal until I hear the vocal. You know, but you know, that uh, API 2500 will do some glorious things with a long release to save a vocal. You can completely change the delivery of a vocal with that 2500 and the Pi compressor. The Pi is a little vaguer in regards to its settings because it's a classic compressor. But you get into that, the API 2500, and you take a vocal that's really spitty and a little bit annoying, and you can make it a beautiful legato vocal by just making that release time three seconds. And then you could click over that other section where you could you know, set even more than that. So I would say the H compressor is like that too. And some of the presets in the H compressor are great, like drum pump. 
And you know, I don't do a lot with parallel compression, but with that H compressor, it's kind of built into it. So you can do that. So there's a lot of great things with that box that if you just start experimenting, if I'm ever at a loss for inspiration, I'll just start looking through some of the presets and I'll be able to just have a, a really quick picture snapshot of maybe something drastic. And that might be a lily pad to a, a great idea that I end up doing, you know? So I wish I had more in regards to just really stellar tricks that will blow your mind and change your world. But the reality is I don't know how other people are working. I only know my workflow. I know that when I reach for these compressors, I instantly get gratification. The reason I reach for the SSL compressor is because I know what it's going to do. And it responds like the SSL that I had in New York. So you turn it up and you can do that thing that you reached for. You know what that high end is going to add in. You know what that over easy compressor is going to sound like. That sounds like the compressor on the SSL. And when I want that compressor on the SSL and dial it in on my plugin, it does the same thing. So it's great in the respect that when you reach into a tool, a tool bag to grab a screwdriver, you're grabbing something, it's a known quantity, and it delivers every time. You know, the Plague Tech EQ stuff, that stuff is fantastic. It operates just like I have a, the Manly Pull Tech here. When you crank in that high end, it has that same sort of gentle sizzle to it that's not in an analog EQ, not in a solid state EQ. Two words of advice. Be passionate about what you do. Don't set your hand to do something if you don't intend to do it to the best of your ability. Because somebody out there is going to do that. And what's the point? So find things to be passionate about. If you're not good at that, find things that inspire you and work on those things. And then just get your bats in. Get your 10,000 hours. Spend some time hunkered down just becoming great finding out what it is that you do that no one else does. 